Lord will bless you back for it for Sunday school. Got a special speaker today. I'm not even sure if he's taught Sunday school since we've been in this building here. I'm not, I don't think you have, brother. Maybe you have. I can't remember. Brother Maxwell, I've asked him to come, and he's going to be uh, studying out of Proverbs chapter 20. So turn your Bibles to there, and let's see what God has for us today. Brother Maxwell, come. And uh, we're, we're so excited to have Brother Maxwell as our new life uh, teacher. And uh, he is uh, dedicated, he's got a passion for it, and he loves souls. Amen. Brother Maxwell, would you come today in Jesus' name? You find a lot of wisdom in the book of Proverbs. Uh, it says that he that fainteth in the day of adversity is weak. A few verses later it says a just man falleth seven times and he gets back up again. And it is you know, our responsibility that when we fall we all going to go through trials and tribulations but it is our responsibility to get back up when Satan knocks us down. And he's pretty good at knocking us down. Um, this book of knowledge, uh, I, w I worked for a man in, in the insurance business one time, and he used to tell us all the time about a lady that uh, she said that she they invited her. She built a multi-million dollar business in just a few years, and, and they wanted to know what her success was, and she kept mentioning, I found it all in the book, and she never did say what book that it came from. And he said at the end of the service, everybody, at the end of the, or whatever it was, they would have and said everybody rush to the front and wanting to know. That, that would be my statement. Thank you very much. That made me a little bit more comfortable. Good. Um, they all rush to the front. Thank you. you. You read my mind. <laughs> if I get tired, of, I almost called Brother Hunt and said, I don't know whether I can stand that long now. My legs are getting very weak. And I went to, the, I called, I was, my doctor retired the same age as I am. And he started to take, and he, uh, he started making us file our own Social Security. And uh, that didn't work very good. But, and so, and I called the VA and said, I need a complete physical. She said, well, you need your leg hurt or your leg hurt. And she end up, she makes a, an appointment for me to have x-rays of my leg. That's not a complete, complete physical. But anyway, they, they all rushed up to see what the woman, what the book the woman was talking about. And when they asked her, they said, she said, well, the book of Proverbs, of course. She said, I read a chapter every single day. She said, it tells you how to treat your fellow man. And it is a book of knowledge. And today we're looking at Proverbs 20 and 5. Counsel in the heart of a man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw them out. Um, and today I'm going to focus more on how to draw out uh, the people, the spirit of God that's with, built within the heart of people. Uh, and, and I believe that there is within every man's heart, every person's heart, a place for the for the Lord Jesus, for the Spirit of God to live. And many people doesn't realize that. In the book of James, it said, you know, we, we need wisdom when we, when we talk to people, when we witness to people. We need the wisdom of God. 
In James 1 and 5, it says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask it of God, of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, it shall be given to him. And I want the wisdom of God. You know, my saying is that I think I have the qualifications of Peter and John. They perceived that they were ignorant and unlearned. But I have, I have two degrees, and one of them is a Ph.D. degree, uh, and, and the other is a B.A. And I got the Ph.D. before I got the B.A. Uh, that doesn't sound logical, but it was. When I was 13 years old, they taught me how to dig post hole diggers, post hole digging. And then when I was 36 years old, I'd lived for God since I was 13. I got, a, I got a B.A. degree. I was born again of the water and the spirit. And to me, that's the most important degree that anybody can have on this earth. Uh, then in James 3 and 17, it says, But the wisdom that is from above is first of all pure, and is peaceable, and is gentle, and is easy, and is easy being traded, full of mercy and good fruits, and without partiality and without hypocrisy. And Proverbs 11 and 14, where no counsel is, the people fall, but in the multitude of counselors there is wisdom. And when we're dealing with people that does not know God or they had no relationship with God, we need the wisdom of God more, much more than we need the wisdom of man. It's important that we understand that. In Proverbs 15 and 22, without counsel, purposes are disappointed, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established, and, and I, I need that wisdom. And you know, when we talk about people coming to God, uh, there are many hindrances that cause people not to come or not want to come to God. Um, first of all, we, we find people that there's no, no God in, in their background or their history. And tradition is a very hard thing to overcome. Um, and, and, and they say, and, and I, I believe also that for a man to say that I need God, it's harder for a man to say I need God than, I, than it is for a woman. Uh, but every one of us needs the Spirit of God living within us. And without it, we're, we're actually nothing. Um, another is that, you know, it, it says I don't need God. You know, I, I'm my own man. When my kids were growing up, when something would break, my wife would go and say, Go tell your daddy he can fix it. And now I'm known as the super glue, super glue king. <laughs> One day they gave me a super glue for my birthday or for Christmas. You know. but, but we can't fix everything without God. We need God in, in our life to help fix things. And there are some things we can't take, fix that don't, it takes only God can fix. And it's getting a little bit warm in here. Is this on my coat? Okay. I'm out of trouble, speaker. <laughs> Thank you. And so we we all need God. And there's some of the hindrances, uh, you know, is people are rich. And they think they don't need anything. They think they're own their own self-made men. You know, you know, I, I got this thing. The rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, What must I do to inherit eternal life? And, and Jesus told him, go and sell everything that you have, and, and then you shall have eternal life. And, and sometimes we put so much hindrances on the thing that we have. I think in the book of Genesis, uh, God told Joseph to, tell, to go back and tell his daddy, put your stuff in the wagon and come to this place for that I have prepared for you. God calls the, the things we have stuff, you know. And we have way too much stuff. And, uh, and then there's people that are, you know, they have fame in their life. And, and they think that, you know, when people look at them and they're famous and they're great actors or they're great politicians, they, they think that everything to them. But that void in the heart of people will never be fulfilled without the presence of God living in that heart. And it's, it's hard to get people to understand that. And then we have people, you know, that like, like going fishing and hunting and sports, you know. To them, that's everything. Uh, I have a brother-in-law. He, he can go and he can catch fish when nobody else can. I went with him one time, and we caught like 12 or 13. We go back in, and 
and people saying, man, they wouldn't bite today. We didn't catch anything. And, you know, he could find them where they're at. And for some people like that, you know, you know, God is secondary, you know, and going fishing and going hunting and, you know, that's first in their life. I have to, I can't go to church. I have to go fishing. I have to go hunting. I have to go do something else. Or I have to go downtown to the ball game. But God is important to people. Uh, then we, we have tradition, and people are deeply street, steeped in tradition. And I'm probably one of the worst one of them. Um, when I, I married my wife and we lived in a, a boarding house, there was a, we, Barbara said that we, we lived together before we got married, but uh, there was a, we, we came to Memphis and there was a, a room and board and there was a big house up front and there was a servant's house in the back and the boys lived in the servant's house and, and I chose her because I wanted to live for God. I wanted somebody that loved God. I didn't want to live with somebody that did not love God. And, you know, and I started to study to be a minister and, and, uh, and you know, she would, she would talk to me. I, they would send me to preach and she'd say, you love God too much not to have the Holy Ghost. And I'm thinking, look, woman, I've got the Holy Ghost. You know, and, and, and that's the way people feel. Uh, and I see some people saying, yeah, I know how that is. And, and in my heart, I felt like I did. I thought, you know, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, you know. But I don't think quite that way anymore. I don't think that we're above everybody else. And, and you know, I've, I've come to learn to discover that, you know, God was with me, but he wasn't in me. And people that love God, God is with them. We, we go out to the nursing home, and, and I, when the other day I went in, I was asking them, I said, uh, how long have you been in church? And I've been in church a long, long time. And I asked another, I've been in church all my life. And I sat there, Brother Hunt, watching them singing. You know, probably none of them were Pentecostal, but they had served God all their life. And they would, and Mary would hand out packets, you know, for them to sing. But they were singing from memory because they loved God. And so God, I figured out God is with them. No, God is with them, but he wasn't in, he was with me, but he wasn't in me. And I knew that I wasn't born again. And, but anyway, my wife, when she would press me, you know, you love God too much not that, like to have the Holy Ghost. And finally, I was going to night school at the University of Tennessee. I quit school in the ninth grade, and, and, um, and I went and got a GED, and, and, uh, and I was going to night school at the University of Tennessee. And, and she pressed me one night, and I said, okay. I said, if God wants me to have the Holy Ghost, I'll pass this test tonight. The teacher had already talked to me and told me, you know, you're, just, you're not getting it. It was English literature, and I hated English literature, you know. You know, and I, so I knew I was going to fail the test. I said, okay, if God wants me to have the Holy Ghost, I'll pass this test. And I go to school, and I take the test. And I, when I got it back, I made 72 on it. I went home. I didn't tell my wife. <laughs> I just stood there, you know. And finally, she said, well, did you pass? Uh, yeah, I made a 72. I passed. Just passing grade. She said, okay, you told God that when you, if you passed that test, you would know that he wanted you to have the Holy Ghost. What you going to do now? And so I go to the bedroom, and I get down on my knees and with an attitude, and I said, okay, God, if you really want me to have the Holy Ghost, give it to me right now. And Barbara says, get up off your knees. You're not going to get them from God like that. You know, and still believing that, that I had everything that God has for me. So many of us that come from different backgrounds and different personalities, we have attitudes that we have everything that God has for us. And that's the reason that tradition rule is so hard to break. You know, it, it is, uh, but, you know, we're talking about Moses. I love what Moses, t Moses t God told Moses, I want you to go and tell Pharaoh to let my children go. And Moses, there was three segments in his life. Uh, the first one was he spent in Pharaoh's house, and then God ran him out. The next 40 years, God ran him out into the desert to raise sheep, and he was a sheep herder. And by this time, he said, but, but God, I'm, uh, I'm a slow speech. You know, I, I, uh, uh, I can't go. And, and God said, my presence will go with you. You don't know how many times I've asked God for his presence to be here today. You know, I don't want to be here if his presence is not here. I don't hardly go anywhere to teach or, you know, that I don't ask God for his presence to be with me. 
I want his presence with me. And I hear Brother Hunt say that sometimes. And we're, you know, we're nothing without God, but with his anointing, we become a tool and instruments in the house of the mighty God. And Isaiah 61 and 1, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of prison to them that are bound. So, you know, we... And many times we, we realize that people are there's a hungry in people's heart for God. Last Sunday I, I saw something I hadn't seen in a long time in this altar. When Brother Hunt was going around pouring the anointing oil upon people, I saw people saying, pour it on my head, including me. I was saying it too. I wanted that anointing. And then when they was doing the clause, I saw old people reaching up. I want one. And there was kids, 13-year-olds, reaching up. I want one, and I saw one young lady, she put the cloth on top of her head, and she was, had her hands on top of her head, and she was standing there praying, and I went over and prayed with her. I saw hungry in the hearts of people for God, and I believe with all my heart that people are hungry for God. Some of them don't even know it. You know, they, they're trying to put these other things in their heart, and they don't realize that they need the presence of God, the, the spirit of the living God living in their heart. You know, and without that, we're nothing. We're incomplete. Uh, and when people are hungry, it's easy to feed them. You know, it is, my brother Cleo, uh, uh, he, he loved God. He, was, he loved to go to singing, you know, the singing, gospel singing. And he got the Holy Ghost at one of them. And I tried to talk to him about, about getting baptized in Jesus' name. He would have none of it. And about 10 years later, he called me. He said, um, I've been talking to uh, the, the preacher that I'm working with on the job, and I've been reading the Bible, and I read where that they got baptized in Jesus' name. And he said, reckon how much y'all would charge me to baptize me in Jesus' name? I said, I reckon we wouldn't charge you anything. I reckon it would make your day. So we, we baptized him in Jesus' name. And we had this lady that came to our church. Uh, you may remember Betty Ernest. She drove 65 miles one way. You know, 135 miles, you know, round trip. And she came on Sunday morning, she came on Sunday night, she came on Wednesday, and she came Saturday to the nursing home a lot of times. And she married this guy. He was a, 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 a Trinity preacher. And, and she called me one day and she said, one morning, she said, Brother Maxwell, said, my husband doesn't understand the Godhead. You think you can come up here and talk to him about the Godhead? And I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm thinking, and I'm, t- I'm talking to her, and I'm stalling her, and I'm thinking, if the knowledge about the Godhead of the truckload, I got about a thimble full. You know how big a thimble? You put it on your finger, you know, keep the little, and, 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 and I'm stalling her. I'm thinking, maybe I can get Brother Black to go, or maybe I can get Brother Trimble to go. And then I remembered what I prayed that morning. Lord, if there's anything you want me to do today, and that's something I like to pray, I want to make myself available for your cause and for your purpose. So I, I drive the, you know, 50 miles up there, everywhere it was, and on the way up there, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm feeling pretty good. I wonder how I'm going to feel coming back down this road. Because you never know how people are going to take what you're giving to them. But when they're hungry, they will eat anything. I've discovered that. When they're hungry, they'll eat anything. And we started to talk, and I started to teach them about the Godhead. I actually took the lesson that we teach, and with a lot of other scriptures, and about every third, about every third lesson, about every third scripture, he'd say, "Man, I was thinking about that this w- today, or you know, last week, or and and here you come explaining." And when I got through, he said, uh, "You wouldn't just happen to have a chance, a copy of those scriptures you'd given me today, would you?" And I said, um, "You know, there's a slim chance that I may, but you would need to be careful." They would still probably have ink on them because I, I just printed them off tonight before I left. And he went and told half his church and he baptized half, he went and told his church and he baptized half his people. And before you're thinking that I'm something really good, if I'd have went and told nine others of his people likewise, they would all they would have run me out the door, you know. You know, it, it, but but when people are hungry, you know, they want God in their heart. Um uh, and some people, that they just had to be awakened, you know. It, uh, Brother Donald Deck was a preacher we, when we was youth leaders. We was going to Gatlinburg, and he told about this lady 
that he had in his church. He said her husband was rich. He owned a manufacturing company and, and said she would do anything in the world that we asked her. And, um, and he said that, well, first she would say, but let first let me check with our hus my husband. And so, you know, this goes on, and, and the man got sick, and some of the young people went over to the hospital and prayed for him, and he got the Holy Ghost. And he came, and he got baptized in Jesus' name, and a year later he went. He got sick again, and he went to the hospital. And he, Brother Deck said, I went over to see him, and he said, Brother Deck, did you a good man? He said, but you're not the reason I got the Holy Ghost. And he said, when the young people came over to see me, he said, I felt the presence of God. But they really, not the reason that I got the Holy Ghost. He said, I've watched my wife all these years. And he said, you know, the spirit that she has and the attitude that she has is beautiful to behold. He said, I wanted what she had. So, you know, if, if you're working with people, that you, your, your life will be the best example that they will ever see of Christ Jesus. And, and then Brother George Glass, he was a, a long time ago, back, you know, back in the 40s probably, he was evangelizing, and Brother Glass talked with a long, southern, slow accent. He said, I was, um, I was going, I, I went down, I think, in Louisiana or, or Florida somewhere to do a revival, and he said, I rode the train down there. And he said, one of the men wanted me to go see his friend. And he said, you know, he said, we went over, and he said, when we walked in the house, the man was running in the vacuum cleaner. He said, I don't know what in the world came over me, but he said, I don't know. He said, I started saying, sir, I can see that you're busy, and we don't want to take a lot of your time. But it, it, he said, if I could, and I had a six-shooter, six-shooter, you know, a pistol, a Western pistol is what, what they call it. He said, I would come tonight and I would put that pistol to your forehead and I would make you get up and come to church. He said, when you got to church, he said, I would take, come back and I'd put that pistol against your head and I'd make you sit there until I got through preaching. He said, when the altar con when, when it came time for the altar call, he said, uh, he said, he said, I would take that pistol and I'd, get, I'd come back there and I'd put it to your head and I'd make you come to the altar and pray. I'd make you get baptized. He said, and he said, I thank you for your time. He said, I turned and walked out the door. He said, I felt so small I could have crawled up in my shoestring. He said, bless the, bless the guy's heart that brought me. He said, uh, he didn't say a word all the way back to carrying me to the my motel. He said, a year later I was at a revival. He said, the guy came up, a guy came up to me, and he said, you may not remember me, but I'm the guy that you talked to about the pistol. And he said, it really got, to t really got to rubbing on me. And he said, a few weeks later, I went to church, and I got baptized in Jesus' name, and I got the Holy Ghost. And, you know, so you never know, you know, what, what it will take to bring people to God. Uh, and one of the questions I love to ask people what is your religious background? And when, when they tell me what their religious background is, it tells me a lot, you know, because I was raised, and my family was uh, Baptist and Cumberland Presbyterian, and um, I think we were baptized, we were supposed to baptize the lady the day that I talked to who came in the wheelchair. She was raised Cumberland Presbyterian. And so I know when they tell me what their you know, what, where they went to church or their parents went to church, I pretty well know how they were baptized. I know what they believe, and I have great compassion on them. Uh, and, you know, I, I know that they probably believe in the Trinity. I know that they probably baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And, uh, um, you know, I, I pray that God will draw them. And I know that, you know, what I was taught, and I, when I was 13 years old, I went and gave my heart to God, and I told God, you know, I, I lived in the, in, the, in the draft age, and I knew that when I got 18, I would have to go and sign up for the draft and probably go to war, so I wanted to make sure that I went to heaven, and I remember distinctly when I walked down that aisle that night when I was 13 years old, there's an evangelist, I want, you know, I want to go, I want to go to heaven. 
So I went down and I gave my heart to God. And, I, and I'm not making, I'm not poking any fun at no religion, you know. They do what, you know, they they were taught to do. And they love God with all their heart. Some of them do. Many of them do. And I went down and I did that. And, I, and on the way back to the pew, I thought, I don't feel any different. I thought you're supposed to feel different when you got saved. They told me I would feel different when I got saved. But I went ahead and I lived for God with all my heart. You know, and it, it, and 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 it's uh, and then when I met my wife, and you know, we we started talking about that, and and so we we need to realize that, and I know now what the real plan of salvation is. I know what the biblical plan of salvation is, and sometimes when I teach it at the prison, I'll I'll open the Bible, you know, in, in Acts two and thirty eight, and. And one of the reasons I do that, I have a Schofield Bible, which is not a Trinity Bible, but, and it's got the dates on top of it. And, and dates does everything. You know, it, it kills theories. It was, there's theories it was just for the disciples. That there was theories that they're just for the day of Pentecost. And I'll read, you know, in 33 A.D., just a few, few, few days after the day of Pentecost. Then Peter said unto them, Repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Well, and, and they did. And here's a kicker. It dawned on me about five years after I got the Holy Ghost. For the promise is to you and your children and all those that are far off. I realize that that's spanning generations. You know, it, it's spanning generations. So it was, not, it was more than just for the, for the disciples. It said, for the promise, and then it said, and as many, and with many other words, did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there was added unto the church, unto them about 3,000 souls. Please notice the word gladly. All they that gladly received his word. You know, if you don't gladly receive it, it's going to just pass over your head, you know. It, it'll go over your head like I don't know what. And then in Acts, the 8th chapter, which is actually 34 A.D., that's one year after the day of Pentecost. So you can't refute, you know, you, you can refute theories and theologies, but you can't refute the Word of God. It, it is not debatable. Uh, in Acts, Acts 4 and 9, For there was a certain man called Simon, who which before which before time in the same day used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that he himself was some great one, to whom they, they all gave heed, and from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is great, has, is great power with God. And to him they gave regard, because that long time he had bewitched them with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip's preaching, the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women, no doubt, in the name of Jesus Christ. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he, com he continued with Philip and wondering and beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that the Samaritans had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost, for as yet he, he would... For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And there are theories that you receive the Holy Ghost when you're baptized. So that short, sort of shoots that in the head, you know. It, uh, and it did not say that they spoke in tongues. And they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. But it didn't really say that they spoke in tongues, but watch this. And... Then Simon saw that through the laying on hands, he, hand of the, the laying on the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given. He offered them money, saying, "Give me also this power that on whomsoever I, I, I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost." You know, and if Simon wanted to buy the power, it was more than people. And, and again, I'm not criticizing anybody. It was more than people just walking up to the front and saying that I accept the Lord. You know, and, and then in Acts the, Acts the 10th chapter, actually in Acts the 9th chapter, it, it talks about Paul, that, you know, that he was, 
that he went into a trance and he he saw he saw he said in Acts nine and one in three days he was there three days and neither eat and neither drank. Back in verse uh, uh, five, and he says, "Who art thou, Lord?" And the Lord says, "I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks." And so, when he asked the Lord, "Who are you, Lord?" "I'm Jesus, whom thou crucified." The voice came back. So Je the Lord called himself Jesus, and then he goes on and. Uh, and he told him, I want you to go to Annas' house. And Annas said, uh, but Lord, you know that this man put a lot of people in jail and he had some of them martyred. And you want me to talk to him and baptize him? Uh, I, I don't think so. But he said, he's a chosen vessel. I want to tell you today, there, there's chosen vessels sitting in this congregation today under the sound of my voice. And there are people that God wants to use for a purpose. Then in Acts the tenth chapter, Cornelius was the first Gentile that ever received the Holy Ghost. And incidentally, this is in 41 AD, and that's eight years after the day of Pentecost. So the Holy Ghost did not stop just on the day of Pentecost. It was more than just for the disciples. Then there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man. One that feared God with all of his house, and he gave much alms to the people, and he prayed always. Four righteous descriptions. You know, I don't care how righteous we become, we still need to be born again of the water and the spirit. Uh, and he told him, he said, he saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day, and the angel of God coming unto him, saying unto him, Cornelius, and when he looked upon him, he was afraid, and he said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up as a memorial before God. Now send to Joppa, send me into Joppa, and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodges with Simon a tanner, whose house is by the wayside. And he will tell you what thou oughtest to do. And if you read on in the verses to follow, Cornelius fasted four days and four nights. If you want something for God, you if you really get earnest from God, and, and you start fasting, you start praying, and you laying in the presence of God, God will come to you. Uh, for, for, for a month or two now, I've been praying, God, come to me, speak to me in the night, you know, speak to me through a vision. And last Sunday morning, about 5 o'clock in the morning, I felt the presence of God come into my bedroom, and he was there for a long time, and he began to show me, I'm no longer just the son of a sharecropper. I used to say, I'm only the son of a sharecropper. And it carried a stigma with it because it was the lowest paying you know, job in, in the country. And, and, and then in verse 33, Cornelius said, Immediately, therefore, I sent for thee, and thou hast done well that thou art come. Now, therefore, are we all present here before God to hear thee, hear all the things that are commanded thee. And he took what the angel told him as he ought to do as a commandment from God. And we need, you know, we need to listen to the voice of God, and we need to listen to what God says. Then in verse 44, again, this is eight years after the day of Pentecost. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them that heard the word, all of them. And they, were, and they of the circumcision of the Jewish people that came with Peter, which believed, were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. But they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. And Peter answered, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And they prayed him that he would tarry certain days. Then the next chapter in verse 11, they took Peter to the council and tried to say, why did you let those Gentiles, and up until then no Gentile had received the Holy Ghost, why did you let those Gentiles receive the Holy Ghost? Peter said in verse 11 of chapter, verse 15 of chapter 11, he said, as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them, as on us at the beginning on the day of Pentecost, it, and it affected them, and they received the Holy Ghost just like we did on the day of Pentecost. And so, we read on, and, and then in Acts, the 19th chapter, which is in 
in 54 AD, which is 21 years after the day of Pentecost. Uh, and it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? And they said unto them, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? He said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, Verily John baptized with the baptism of repentance, and we do have to repent, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which had come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I read that when, when, when the Lord called, asked, when Peter asked, the, I mean, when Paul asked the Lord, who are you? He said, I'm, I'm the Lord. That when you read in Paul's writing, he always called him Lord Jesus after that. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues, and they prophesied. And so this was, you know, that sort of kills a theory. And, you know, I'm not quoting from the UPCI doctrine. I'm not quoting from the, you know, from the Cayuga First Pentecostal doctrine. I'm quoting from the Word of God, and this is the way I do it when I, when I go to the prison. We baptize a lot. We've had like seven people to get out, and they're preaching the gospel now. And we, a few weeks, uh, about six months ago, we had a young boy that came. He was in his early 20s, and he had hair all the way down to his belt. And he had it in a ponytail, and he kept it clean. And I have to say, he kept it nice looking. And he came, and he, he, he roomed up with a boy that, I don't know, he probably brought every roommate he gets, the elder cell, he call them cellmate he gets, he brings them, you know, and I don't know how many he brought, but, and he came and he got the Holy Ghost, and, and uh, I thought, I can, oh, I hope it's a while before we teach on the, Lent, uh, on the holiness, but, you know, he got the Holy Ghost, and then a glow, it, when, every, when he comes in, there, there's a glow on his face, and he stood up the other night, and he testified, he said, and we were taking prayer requests, and he said, I don't have a prayer request, but I got to get this out of, my, out of my soul, you know. He said, before I came in here, he said, I messed up. He said, I was messed up with the law. He said, uh, I, was, I got on drugs. He said, uh, I lost my house. I lost my wife. I lost my car. I lost my job. He said, when I got the Holy Ghost, I haven't had, and that was on, I was on medication for depression. I was on suicide watch. He said, since I've come and got the Holy Ghost, it has changed my life, you know, so tremendously. I mean, when you see him, he talks, there's a glow that's on his face. It's a Holy Ghost glow. Uh, so there are, there are people out there. I may find that chair in a minute. And I almost called Brother Hunt last night. I said, I don't know whether I can stand up that long or not. So I'm just going to sit down. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Patton. You read my mind, wouldn't you? So there are hungry people out there that are hungry for, for the Spirit of God. And, you know, we have to be sensitive to their needs when we, we come into contact with them. And, and, what, and I want to say what you are speaks so loud, I can't hear a word you're saying. Uh, our third, my, my granddaughter came to work for me two years while she was in college. She worked part-time. And just out of nowhere one day she told me, she says, Papa, I'm so glad that you got a close relationship with God. She said it affects all of the members of the family, all the members of the family. I want to tell you that what you are living for God is going to affect all of your family. Uh, I was uh, there, in my family. There's preachers back all the way back to 1850, and and I'm a product of, of the life they lived and the and, and the prayers that they prayed. My mother. You know, she was, she was not Pentecostal, but I am what I am today. Thank you. You're very sweet. Woo-hoo. <laughs> she told it one day. Uh, we was over in another church, and we were a lot younger then, and I was running, and I heard something behind me going, woo <laughs> And I looked, and she was about to run over me. <laughs> but uh, I forgot where I was at, but, you know, I am what I am today because my mother, I'd wake up in the morning and I would hear her praying. I would, she would be in, in the kitchen and it was an old hard floor and she would be wearing a flour sack dress and she would be cooking on a wood cook stove. 
and she'd be singing songs to Jesus, and, and she taught us about Jesus, not by word by mouth, but by the example that she lived. What you are, is, you know, if I could, you know, this is called the still standing clay. But I, if I could, I would, I would change it to the faithful, the, the mature people of, of God. Y'all are the ones that mature. Y'all are the ones that bring people to God. And, and then we, I had this, I was an insurance agent. And I had this Afro-American lady come in one day with her sister. And I kept church cards on my desk, and I, I loved it. Uh, that was, and, and, and I think I, mi I missed that part about it more than anything else. People come in, they look at those church cards. Is this where you go to church? Sure is. <laughs> I always feel it. It would come up in here. And I, and those two ladies talking to me, and we got talking about God. And when they started out, though, I heard one of them say, Whoo, I feel something in this place. I'm talking about an insurance office. You know, you can take, God, I believe, I've come to, Brother Patton, I've come to the conclusion that, that, the, that people feel the presence of God that's living within us. You know, and if, if we live right, then, then, then we're, we, we're right. Um, and so today, we, you know, I hope that you have gleaned a little bit from this lesson. And I, I thank you for enduring uh, your time listening to this old man ramble. But thank you for coming today, Brother Patton. How many of you enjoyed that? Amen. All right, let's see. We've got eight minutes. Brother, uh, Brother Hunt, come over there, and he leaned over to me, and he said, Now, if he cuts a little short, I want you to go up there and fill in. <laughs> so I'm here to fill in, and while I was sitting back there, uh, the lesson was on Proverbs 20. I come across a couple of verses how many of you would like to have a couple of them brought out by you? Ah, I thought that was good. All right, turn to Proverbs 20. I'm going to uh, pull out a couple that I like, and I'm going to let a couple people just explain them in a paragraph or less. We've got nine minutes. Proverbs 20, verses, verse 3. If you could put that up there, Sister Simi. It is an honor for a man to be, to cease from strife, but every fool will be meddling. Sister Turner, I think you're perfect for this. <laughs> One paragraph. Well, to me, what I see in that is, number one, slow to anger on the first part, but every fool will be meddling. The Bible says study to show thyself approved unto God and that you are to, in reality, there's a scripture, and this is my own version, that you mind your own business. You don't meddle in other people's business because, number one, it's none of your business. And it stirs up strife. It stirs up. It's gossip. And so you, you leave the fool meddles in other people's lives and, and uh, troubles when really they need to keep their mouth closed. <laughs> That's pretty good, isn't it? <laughs> Let's give her a hand clap. <laughs> you didn't know we were going to have a bunch of teachers huh, today. Brother Mann, you're next. <laughs> we never hear Brother Mann, okay? Right? Okay. Turn, uh, put up number six. Verse six. This one's a good one, brother man. You're going to like this. You're a good man, right? Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. What do you think? Of, give me a paragraph. You got it. Sister Courtney, you want to bail them out? Oh, come on now. Okay, I guess we're going to fall back to Sister Charlotte. Sister Charlotte, what does that mean? Most men will proclaim every one his, his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. I'd say most everybody in their own eyes thinks that they're pretty good. Um, 
But I, mean, I think, you know, God will find you out. No matter how good you think you are in your own eyes, you know, the truth will come out. That's good. Let's give her a hand clap. <laughs> Proverbs is a tough one. I mean, uh, when I have, when every time I go through it, I try to mark them all down. And if you followed all of these, uh, you could be very wise. Brother Del Rios, come up here for just a second. I got one for you. Verse 13. Love not sleep, lest thou come to poverty. Open thine eyes, and thou shalt be satisfied with bread. You know, Brother Patton, as soon as you said that, the first thing that hit me was, love not sleep. In other words, you know, show your feelings and show uh, your love for the brethren and lift people up. And don't put people down um, because that's, that's easy to do. Uh, it's, it's, it's easy to put somebody down, then that'll make you feel better about yourself. You know, we all struggle in life, you know, to keep ourselves high on, uh, on, on, our, own, you know, on our own lives. And it's very uh, difficult to keep ourselves up there. But, you know, a lot of times if you bring somebody else up, Especially when they're feeling down, because you don't ever know how they're feeling at that time. Trust me, God will bless you for that. That's good. Brother, Brother Dale, what time do you get up every morning? 6.15. <laughs> Let's give him a hand clap. I knew he got up early. <laughs> uh, some people say, oh, that's not early, Brother Patton. It is for Brother Patton. <laughs> Brother Bo Briggs, come on up here. I've got one for you. This is great. This is Bo Briggs all over it. Verse 14. It is not, it is not, said the buyer, saith the buyer, but when he is gone his way, then he boasteth. Billy likes to put me on the spot. It's one of his like favorite things to do, as you notice, but. Uh, I've read Proverbs a lot. It's one of my one of my favorite books, and uh, to me, I think a lot of times Proverbs kind of gets out of the spirituality of the Bible. It teaches you a lot about life, like the previous scripture you talked about. It's it's a lot truth in it, and uh, the scripture he brought up. It's not not saith the buyer, but when he goes his own way, he boasts, and that's very true. But it's not the way you should do it, or the way you should look at it. It is the way that it happens, but yes, it does happen, and uh, that is how we do things. When we buy a bargain, we walk off and go, wow, I stole that, or wow, I just made a lick on that car, but and the truth is you helped somebody do something, or somebody helped you do something, and you sh should be thankful for it and appreciative. <laughs> I knew that was perfect for him. How many times you go there and you look at a car and you're like, oh, it's got bad tires on it. i got to replace the tires. The paint's a little peeling a little bit. And you look at all the bad things about it. And then when you leave, you say, man, I stole that. Yeah. The Jewish lullaby, buy low, sell high. <laughs> uh, that's good. Okay, one last one. We've got two minutes. Brother East. This is for you. Come on up here, brother. Verse 29, Sister Sammy. The glory of young men is their strength, and the beauty of old man men is the gray hair head. <laughs> I don't have any hair. <laughs> he has more gray hair than I do. Uh, yeah. Young men often depend upon their strength to get things done. Consequently, Lloyd has a whole lot harder process of dealing with them because they are in their prime and they are in their cam nose. He tries to do everything because he thinks he can, picking up objects that end up later on in life, hurting backs, hurting their physical self. 
but it's the same spiritually also where an old man tries very hard to do things the easy way or thinks about it a little bit and processes it before he just goes and grabs and consequently they come up with great hair or in my case scalp. <laughs> Let's give Brother East a good hand. <laughs> Proverbs is chock full and it's got all kinds there. You can go many different ways, but let's all stand. We're going to transition this service. We have another 10 minutes in between uh, services. We have some visitors here. Why don't you step out across the aisle while we transition this service and shake some people's hand, tell them how much you're happy to have them here at Collierville First Pentecostal Church, and we will be starting in 10 minutes. <laughs> 